I'd like to start this interview the same way that you started your book by telling some of the commonly the the commonly known uh, myths about the economy that so many people just accept as facts. Um, I would love for you to go through some of those and to maybe tell us why those myths are so persistent. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to start dealing with this in a historical historical way, because I have found in, in all of my life as a teacher that putting things in a historical context is one of the best ways to make them understood. So I'm going to go back to the French and American revolutions back in the 18th century, uh, which is the time we normally date when the previous economic system, feudalism, was finally overthrown. Uh, and in this case, by violent revolutions, uh, particularly in France and the United States, but it was in other countries too. And they were against feudalism, those revolutionaries. Uh, for example, here in the United States, we didn't just want to be independent of Great Britain. And we didn't just want not to have uh, King George III continue to be the sovereign. We didn't replace King George when we won our independence with another king. I had no intention of doing that. And we didn't replace European feudalism with an American variety. We broke with all of that. And we developed a different economic system, capitalism. And the same thing in the French Revolution. And the place I wanna start is by pointing out that those two revolutions brought forward uh, a kind of agenda, if you like, for what it was that the transition to capitalism was supposed to enable, bring to our people everywhere. In France, they, they did it you know, in French style. They came up with three words, liberty, equality, fraternity. The American Revolution agreed with all of that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and the others, that they were all part of this kind of break, but they added this other word, democracy, so that capitalism would replace feudalism and bring with it liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. Well, the basic critique of capitalism starts right there, namely with the historical observation that we sure got capitalism and feudalism is a vague memory, but the liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy that the capitalist revolution promised has never been delivered. If I were harsh, and I try not to be, I would refer to those as false promises. I don't need to explain to you about inequality. I mean, because we live here in the United States at a time when capitalism has delivered levels of inequality that require us to go back to ancient Egypt and the Pharaoh to come up with something like this. A few weeks ago, many of us watched as the two richest men in the United States, each possessing around $200 billion each, competed with one another to spend tens of millions of dollars to spend eight or nine minutes in a rocket ship going around the earth. This while we have unspeakable poverty all over the world, this while people are dying as we speak of a disease they do not have to die from, and I could go on, but you know all of that. And what about liberty? What about brotherhood or fraternity? Uh, I must tell you in all my effort to not be harsh, that these things don't exist for most people in this planet. Capitalism has not brought any of that. We don't treat each other as brothers. Again, just a simple example. I am an American citizen. I have had not only two vaccinations against COVID, I've now had the booster shot. But in Africa, it's still less than six, last time I looked, less than 6% of the people in that continent have got any shot. 
This is crazy. This has nothing to do with what I understand to be Christian or Muslim or Jewish or any other ethics or morality in which we take care of ourselves and watch the rest of the world die. So I don't see it. And perhaps most important, I don't see democracy. And I'm going to stress there one kind of democracy, because it's the one you may not have thought about. If democracy means anything, it means that if you are affected by a decision, then democracy says you have an inalienable right to participate in making that decision since you are required to live with its results. I mean, basically, that's the idea why we vote uh, for the, the local mayor or the president or anybody in between. The idea is they make decisions that certainly affect us. And so we must have some input. And even if you're not satisfied, the vote is at least something. Well, then let's look at capitalism. Capitalism is a system for organizing the production and distribution of goods and services. It is different from other ways of doing that. In feudalism, you had a lord and a serf. In slavery, you have a master and a slave. That's how they organized the production and distribution of goods and services. For most of the history of the human race, we organized the distribution after we had produced goods according to social or religious rules, contemporary examples. A contemporary factory, a contemporary office, a contemporary store. Those of you who've had to work for a living, you know very well, even if you haven't put it in these words, that every day when you cross the threshold into the place where you work, you are entering a space from which democracy has been excluded from the beginning of this country's history to this minute. When you go to work and you hang up your coat, you sit down where somebody tells you is your place. You work with whatever equipment they provide. You do whatever task they tell you to. You use the technology they have chosen. And at the end of the day, something very interesting happens. You are told, go home. Whatever you did during the day, using your brains and your muscles, instantaneously belongs to the employer. Your job is to go home, have a beer, maybe six, and a pizza, maybe six, and get ready to come back tomorrow and do it all again. Do you vote for your employer? Never. Is your employer accountable to you for the decisions he or she makes? Absolutely not. Your employer decides what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the output, and you are excluded from every one of those decisions. The capitalist workplace has never permitted democracy to enter. And let me be real clear with you. Democracy is very easy to explain in capitalism because all of you already know. It's one of those interesting psychological realities. You don't know, but upon closer investigation, you do. Here's how it works. Everybody in the workplace has one vote. The skilled technician, the unskilled technician. Just like when you go to elect the mayor, Everybody gets a vote, whether they've had PhD or a GED or anything else. 
and the workplace could be organized democratically. One person, one vote, majority decision decides what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with it. But we don't have a democratic workplace, except in a tiny number of very specialized workplaces that have been formed by people who care about all of this. And they have a name here in the United States. They're called worker co-ops. And maybe later we'll talk a bit about them. But for the moment, I'm answering Rachel's question and I'm telling you that the workplace is a fundamentally anti-democratic institution. It's organized like an autocracy. Whoever owns the business, if it's an individual or a family, if it's a partnership, if it's a board of directors of a corporation, it is a tiny minority of the people whose lives are affected by that workplace. First and foremost, do you have a job? Can you keep the job? Can you earn a living? The employer has the right in capitalism to fire you, to take away from you your livelihood, throwing you, your family, the future of your children, all into a turmoil. And capitalists jealously guard that right. So let me tell you where this argument ends in the interest of time. Most adults in the United States and every other capitalist country, most adults spend most of their adult life in the workplace. You know, five out of seven days in most cases, 40 hours, the best hours of those five days. And when you're not at work, you know, you're getting, getting ready in the morning and putting on your makeup or coming back and recuperating. If you add up all the hours, that's where you give an enormous part of yourself. So don't call this a democratic country because the place where most adults spend most of their time is exactly the opposite of democracy. So we don't have democracy. We never did. We allow a formal kind of it, you know, every year we can go into a little booth, move a little handle and we vote it. And I'm glad we have that. But to consider that as qualifying you for a democratic society means you don't know what the word means or you're trying to put lipstick on a pig and that doesn't change the pig. Okay, so for me, if I had to, that's the most fundamental mythology about capitalism, that it is the brother or sister of democracy or that it's the vehicle that brings us democracy. It doesn't. It's precisely the most important institution preventing liberty, equality, and democracy. It's not just that it isn't democratic, but it holds it back. And let me conclude by summarizing how that works. If a tiny number of people sitting at the top of every enterprise, factory, office, store, is in a position to tell the vast majority of people, the employees, what to do, how to do, where to do, and all the rest, then no one should be surprised that in capitalism, the fruits of an enterprise, the, the output of the factories and the offices and the stores, is taken by the people who have all the power inside the enterprise to make sure it works for them. The employees are basically there to do a job and get paid. Everything else is in the hands of the others. So why are we surprised that they take the lion's share of the output for themselves and thereby become very wealthy? and try not to have to give up any of it to the employees. Why are we surprised? Inequality is the fruit of organizing the production system in this employer-employee way. 